of the annual BW Faith and Life Lectures. I'm Ellen Poseman, the Chair in Faith and Life here at BW. Um, I, the, I just have, for those of you who were here last night, you know what a treat you're in for and how amazing Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis was last night. For those of you who were not here last night, you're also in for a treat. <laughs> you just don't know yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, so I just have a couple of announcements that are the same ones that I made last night, which are that the only restrooms in this building are two floors down. Um, there's an elevator behind me. There are stairs behind you. Uh, if you get a parking ticket, <laughs> come see me. I will see what I can do about it. It's easier if it's a BW one than if it's a city one. Um, Today, I am just here to welcome you back for day two, but our introductions of our presenters today are going to come from C.J. Harkness. C.J. Harkness is the Director of Spiritual Life here on campus as of this year, so he's also, I'm new in my position. C.J. here is new in his position. He teaches classes for us in the religion department and is uh, in charge of this building and services here. His staff has been incredibly amazing at setting everything up for you today, as has uh, our assistant in our department in the Office of Faith and Life, Hannah Budick, who is around here somewhere. So with that, I'm going to pass this mic on to CJ. Good morning. It is good to see all of you and welcome. As Ellen has already said, we're glad to be here for our Faith and Life Lecture Series. It has been an exciting weekend already. I, I, in introducing Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis, I, I think the human, uh, as I have experienced, is more important than anything else to know. I, I said to her last night, as um, we, were, we were coming into last night's lecture, I have never met anyone who I knew as well before our first meeting <laughs> as I do Dr. Lewis and reading, reading her book. I don't, I don't know that I said this to you, but her transparency um, made me feel like I was hiding. And it encouraged me in many ways to come into light to expose and examine the things that, that I lived through in my own personal life, and I hope in the same way will expose all of us, not only to see who it is that we can be and how it is that we can change the world, but to understand how all of the others that we encounter along the way are very much a part of that journey. I'm not going to belabor the hour anymore, but let's please give a round of applause for Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, CJ. So good to meet you. Um, and I'm going to be bringing to the floor soon, or to the podium, I guess I'll say, um, friend, brother that I'm gonna introduce in just a second. But just first of all, let me say thank you for taking time to come to this space today. Uh, there's lots of choices you can make on a Thursday morning, so for you to come to this room really delights me. Um, I'm just geeky enough to be thrilled that people ask me to sign books. I'm like, what the? So thank you for, thank you for reading the book. Thank you for being excited about the book. Uh, thank you for wanting to talk about the book. But most especially, thank you to you, Ellen and CJ, um, for welcoming me into a space. Um, people who do the work that we do, as uh, people uh, conversing about faith or spirit or justice, uh, can't talk into a vacuum. You need conversation partners. You need people to work it out with you, to construct theology with you, to construct ideas with you. So if there's nobody talking back or listening, then you just could quit your job and go to Paris. I don't know. So thank you for coming. I'm really grateful. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Ubuntu, uh, your program says. And I want to say what that is, uh, repeat myself a bit from last night. Ubuntu is this kind of ancient philosophy that 
develops in the Sub-Saharan African continent. It, all the Sub-Saharan African languages have a word that's similar to that, Ubuntu. Uh, I actually first heard the word Ubuntu when I was doing a leadership class, and this guy who wrote the fifth discipline was talking about Ubuntu, I'm like, what is that? So I'm like, I'm really an Anglo, uh, uh, Harvard grad was talking about Ubuntu as a principle for making a better business. What is that about? If you Google Ubuntu now, you'll find it talking about computer systems and leadership classes, right? It's about interrelatedness. So this word has lots of um, derivations now in terms of use. But its origin is in these languages, uh, Ubuntu, Ingubuntu, Ingubantu. Uh, uh, a person is a person through other persons. A human is a human through other humans. Not a single word, not a singular word for human, but humanity is what's human. So the, the concept is literally, you can't be human unless you're in relationship with other humans. Like I said, I can't be a thought leader or a, a theologian constructing theology by myself. You can't be human by yourself. You're not human by yourself. You're human because there are other humans around you. Or you're human because you're in relationship with humans who are saying to you, ah, you are human in fact. Yes, indeed, I will bless your humanity. And in fact, when these uh, folks greet each other, they say, salbona. Will you say that, salbona? Sal Which means, I see you. Salbona, I see you. And the response back is, sikona, with a click, or ninkona with a click, depending on which language, but that response is, I exist. So say sinkona. I exist. In my first uh, church in Trenton, New Jersey, uh, we used to pass the piece with sinkona, um, salbona sinkona, as a, as a conversation. So, I see you. Why are you here? Oh, I see you. I see you being a 14-year-old genius, or I see you being a wonderful psalmist, or I see you being an amazing dad, or I see you being an amazing administrator, right? I see you, I see your vulnerabilities, I see your, um, your prickly bits. Um, I say prickly bits to my granddaughter, Ophelia, she cracks up, she just thinks that whatever the onomatopoeia is for her is prickly bits, she's like, that's so funny. But I see your prickly bits, I see your warts, but I see your beauty, I see your loveliness, I can see your kindness, hope. I can see uh, your generosity. I can see you in process, right? This is what it means to be human, is to be a mirror for each other, uh, uh, a window uh, for each other, so that we can keep becoming. So we're gonna talk about that today um, as a way, Salbona, as a way to think about being human on the planet, to think about how we're gonna love each other fiercely, how we love each other fiercely, uh, I'm saying Ubuntu is fierce love, so I'll say more about that. We'll talk about what I mean by that. I'll tell some stories, because I like that. But before we get started any further, I want to just ground us um, in an intention, in a, in a prayer. Um, the Reverend Michael Ray Matthews is a, uh, a brother now to me. We met as... Uh, senior fellows at Auburn Theological Seminary, probably before that, doing some work in the world, but got to be uh, colleagues, got to be friends. He is the um, deputy director of a wonderful uh, organization called Faith in Action that actually does national organizing for justice, trainings, interfaith conversations, um, creating platforms, training leaders, uh, building relationships across faith across the country. And he can sing. So I'm gonna invite Michael Wade to offer us a piece of music. And then in my talk, I'm gonna do some stuff. I'm gonna invite Michael Wade to converse with me around some stuff, and then I'm gonna wrap. So that's how the uh, time will go. Cool? Can you get with that? Does that work? Welcome, Michael Wade. Good morning. Thank you, dear sister Jackie. Indeed, it's been a blessing to become your sibling over these past oh, more than a decade now. Yeah, it's right. been a real blessing. Thank you for seeing me. I feel seen, Sikona. Uh, thank you for including me in this and for seeing the connection 
not only of my story and my gifts to what you're trying to bring to this community, but seeing the connection that exists in this institution in the person of C.J. Harkness, who was my first cousin. His dad and my mother are brother and sister. So I get a chance not only to bear witness to you blessing this community, but to also spend some time with my dear cousin, who is really our family pastor. I'm his senior, but he's the family pastor. I want to offer a song for our moment of intention and centering that is really a poem, an ancient poem by the mystic Rumi. And it's a, it's a poem about connection, about interrelatedness, about Ubuntu. It's a song about love and desire. It's a song about breath and what it means to long for deep connection with that which is sacred and holy. Will you bow with me as we allow this poem to be our prayer this morning? There is some kiss we want with our whole lives. The touch of spirit on the body. Sea water begs the pearl to break its shell. And the lily, how passionately it needs some wild. Darling, at night I open the window and beg the moon to come and press his face against mine breathe into me breathe into me breathe into me breathe into me, breathe into me. close the language door Open the love window. The moon won't use a door, only the window. Close the language door and open the love window. The moon won't use a door. church, we sometimes clap our amens. So I'm just going to say, it's okay to clap an amen. Close the language door and open a window. Wow, thank you so much. When the pandemic came uh, in March of 2020, Middle Church, which is so incredibly diverse, um, old, young, black, white, Asian, indigenous, Hispanic, male, female, non-binary, little people, big people, people with immunocompromised systems, people who have pre-existing conditions. When we heard about the pandemic, we made an immediate plan to shut down because we thought love meant keeping each other alive. I remember the, the day the staff said, 
Sunday's our last Sunday. That's it. That's it. We're like, are we ready? We don't know, but we're going to get ready. Can we broadcast worship? Can we make a worship movie to show? We're going to make a plan because Sunday is our last Sunday in person. And we took um, a beautiful bass baritone named Wesley. We took our pianist. We took our clergy. We took one of our dancers. We wore gloves and masks and almost like hospital gowns because we had no idea what, like we put I can throw this awayness clothes on because we didn't know much enough about COVID to know what was safe, what would help us to stay safe. But we were in there socially distanced with our gloves and preaching and singing and um, doing the thing and we recorded that. Uh, and then on the Friday after that Sunday, my son Joel and his, his wife Gabby moved in with us with their two kids into our house in New Jersey. They thought they were coming for a couple of weeks. They had a small apartment in Harlem and they just wanted some air, elevator too tight. The baby was three weeks old. His name is Octavius, named after a freedom fighter named Octavius Cato. God, he's cute, oh, he's cute. Ophelia is two years, almost two years and two months to the day older than her little brother. So with a two-year-old and the three-week-old bring their parents and a week's worth of clothing to our house in New Jersey. What was it like to be isolated with a toddler and an infant and their parents? Well, I'm going to say, and you can judge me if you want to, we actually drank more than we should have. <laughs> when it was 5 o'clock anywhere, it was cocktail time for Gabby, Joel, Jackie, and John. We're going to cook. Yes. Let's pour ourselves a glass of wine while we cut those vegetables, right? <laughs> we made a ritual of that glass of wine and that vegetable cutting to process our work life, to process our day. The babies were so wonderful and so demanding. It was a job. We would put Octavius on the kitchen counter while we cut the vegetables in his little bassinet and just let him stare at us and we would stare back at him. He often did my Zoom meetings with me on my bed when it was my turn to watch him. Ophelia had the run of the house and would come in and out of meetings, climb up on your lap, sit there for a few minutes and then go, I gotta go, and then get up and go and leave. But we were a family like, oh my joy, intergenerational, playful. I was the shopper because I'm younger than my husband but didn't have babies, so I was the one that went to the grocery store and washed oranges. Did y'all wash oranges? We washed oranges. Um, I was a little bit fanatical about it, to be honest, not bringing germs home, but that family system, that, that um, container that we made together with the two babies and the younger adults and the older adults was the joy of my life. You would never get that back again, but we had it. We found ourselves really living out this Ubuntu idea, which is a story illustrates better than a, a theory. You know, Octavius makes his first coup and, and we're like, yes, look at you. And we're all silly baby talking, you know. Yes, little man, yes, 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 oh my God. He bites his toes, and we like celebrate the toe biting. <laughs> Ophelia picks up new words, um, and we cheer her on and throw her up in the air. Um, one of my friends, Titus Burgess, um, had a song out called 45, and she just loved it. It was a kind of a, it was a critique of the president at that point, but, it, <laughs> but not saying you have to have it, but he, he had it, and his song was so like, Ba, 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 ba. like good beats for a little kid and the video was hilarious there were people in weird glasses and dancing about she learned the choreography she learned the choreography and then she learned the choreography to almost every song on Moana and every time she learned a new dance she taught it to us and we saw her and we celebrated her and she kept becoming her because we saw her and we celebrated her. Ophelia, you're such a good dancer. Oh my God. Now, at almost five, 
when she does a pirouette, when she, she's a climber, that girl will climb up everything. Watch this, Nana, she's up on top of the refrigerator just about jumping down on the ground, like, holy God, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. Her parents are not those fear parents, right? They're like, good on you, baby. Watch your body. So, you know, she climbs, she falls, she falls, she climbs. She's a little feral, if I'm honest, but the parents celebrate her athleticism. They see her as fearless. Why would they stick fear in her? Just watch your body, love. Do you have a plan? Can you see how close that sharp table is to your head? Do you need to move before you tumble? Okay, set it up. Now go, good job. I was not raised that way. <laughs> no. Get do not, get, get down. <laughs> Furniture is not for climbing. <laughs> Their whole house is a gym now in Philadelphia. We saw Octavius take his first steps when he was nine months old. We saw him laugh and dance and laugh and dance. And we see that at three, he doesn't really feel like talking. He's not really talking that much. But there's no judgment on that. We just see that he doesn't need words because Big Sister has enough for everyone. <laughs> we see he's funny when he's little and he knows he's funny. And he's three, and he can craft a joke. They call John, my husband, Pop Pop. And they have a whole running joke about how Pop Pop sounds. It, we don't all get it, but the two of them are very close, and they just get it. And if they say Pop Pop, they're rolling in the floor with whatever all that means for them. We saw these little people become almost one person in the COVID time. And so we see their closeness. Mommy and Daddy said, that's brother. Before she could say Octavius, which she can say quite well now, Octavius, she, he was brother. They, they wanted the children to see their relationship before they even knew the name. That's brother, that's sister. We have a zillion pictures of them hugged up together doing anything. Ophelia, now you see right here, Octavius? This one is the bad guy, Marvel Comics, right? This one is the bad guy, but Spidey is the good guy. So Spidey, Octavius is Spidey all the time. <laughs> right? <laughs> Shooting and Hulk smashes. They have been seen as close, they behave close. They have been seen as adventurous, they behave adventurous. They've been seen as athletic, smart, kind, generous. Not so helpful. Ophelia will say, I don't think I should have to do chores because she's a precocious almost five-year-old. So we're trying to see her in to help her. Um, that's Octavius's role. The children also saw us. They saw us afraid. I was afraid. I was afraid I'd be the one that goes to the store and brings home a thing that I didn't know how it got transmitted. They saw us tense and they picked up our tension. They saw us overworking, because COVID taught us that we could work all day. Did you learn that lesson? <laughs> all day and all night. So we lived in a family together, and we became who we saw each other to be. And that was my experience with my grandchildren, but I also had that experience in my family of origin, right? I'm the oldest child of a family of five. We found our half-brother a little later in life, but I had already claimed oldest child, so I kept it, right? <laughs> but um, we were raised by two people from Mississippi who were raised by people in Mississippi who were raised by people in Mississippi who were raised by people who had been enslaved, who were from Africa. And all of those generations of ways to be and things to know and culture and how you eat and what you serve and how you pray, you know, how you dance, all of that stuff came to my body from my parents and my siblings. And we shape each other, right? This seeing and becoming is about shaping each other. Our parents shaped us. I'm the oldest, so I shaped them. 
This is what it means to be good. This is what it means to obey. This is how we serve the dinner. This is how we cook. This is how the girls cook and clean the kitchen at the Super Bowl, because the boys get to watch the game. Just saying, we saw that too. We became that too. We formed that too, right? We were formed in relationship to our parents. We were formed in relationship to each other. Psychodynamically, right? The parents are the so-called idealized objects. Do you all, anybody know? It's like, right? So they're the idealized objects. We can't wait for them to affirm us. We need their approval. We want to take in their yes. Yes, Jackie, you're a good singer. Yes, Jackie, you can do math. No, Jackie, you can't major in music, right? Like all of the, all of the things that they saw for me, wanted for me, formed me. My siblings and I formed each other. My sister and I, a dyad with the three boys, the boys competing for basketball and football, pushing each other, right? Excellence. We're not, we're not B people, mm -mm -mm. we are A plus people. We formed each other. My, my middle brother, who's a genius, would, would just was the first one to rebel that our grades were on the refrigerator. <laughs> why, are your gra why are our grades on the refrigerator? Because we were forming each other. We're gonna get good grades, we're gonna get good testing, we're gonna do the right stuff because we are black in America in order to achieve, you gotta do it better, faster, longer, harder, right? That, that was formation in the relationship we were formed. And we were formed by the very best of my parents and we were also formed by their stuff. You too. Anybody here parents don't have stuff? Okay, we're formed by their formation. They're formed in a context, you're formed in a context, we're all formed in a context. So when I say, I see you, you exist, when I say, I am who I am because you are who you are, that's for better, that's for worse. That's interrelatedness. That means we're responsible to and for each other's well-being. My thriving, my surviving, Dr. King, we are woven in a garment, interconnected in a garment. I can't be fully who I am until you are fully who you are. Yes, that's right. The hungry child in Appalachia is connected to how we use our funds. The oceans are connected to our use of plastic, right? The Buddhists would say if a butterfly wing moves over here in India and affects the air over there, fact. The, the child who still doesn't have clean drinking water in Jackson, Mississippi, should make us thirsty. That they still don't have clean drinking water in Flint, Michigan, is appalling and should make us angry. That seniors can't pay their bills should send us to the way we vote the, in the voting booth, right? The fact that college loans cripples people who graduate ought to make us think about policy. We are each other's people. We are each other's keepers. and the. Things that affect you affect me, and we should be always thinking, always thinking about how my neighbor, who I'm called to love, is affected by this decision I make. I make the decision about where I shop, about where I live, about what school district I put my children in, about, about what I listen to on the television, which stations I turn on and off, what music I listen to, all of the stuff that forms us because they're formed by people and people form us. Are you with me? All of that stuff, all of those decisions, all of those interactions, everyday choices that we make affect all of us. All of us. Right? No, nobody on an island by themselves. And that's the macro part of this Ubuntu thing. But in the smaller place, I work in a system, in the more micro place, I work in a system of churches connected to each other, steeped in history. 1628. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> right. Before Manhattan was Manhattan, my church. Before America was America, my church. The oldest corporation in America is my church, the collegiate church. Able to keep property and land and money because the King of England made a compromise when England took over Manahatta, 
that the Dutch Reformed Church took from the Lenape. That's my people. That's my story. I work in a system that, is, that began in 1628 to form people, to form the city, to form the nation. It's our polity, our church polity, that shaped American government polity. Be with me. You hear me? Not African stuff like consensus building, but the way our government works. My church, thank you very much. Gave it as a gift to the nation. <coughs> I work in a system every day that started forming people in 1628 that still affects me in 2023 with white supremacist ideologies, capitalist ideologies, power over ideologies. I, I was a little gentler last night. We don't have that much time today. <laughs> with with um, male privilege ideologies, women should be quiet ideologies. My blackness does not matter as much as your whiteness ideologies. Those ideologies form the people in the system. Salbona, I see you, you exist. But if you don't see me, I exist in your erasure, right? Yeah. right? If you don't see that kid becoming, if you don't see that man hurting, if you don't see those indigenous people, quote, being discovered, if you don't see me as a potent, powerful agent of change, if you don't see me, I don't exist in your imagination, in your ecology, in your sociology. I'm not there. So from way out here where everybody's stuff is everybody's stuff and the decisions we make matter to closer in home, the people we decide not to value, not to count on, not to regard, not to regard as beautiful and strong and powerful, we disappear them the black girls who haven't been found, the ones that haven't come back from Chibok, the indigenous women that are dead, that nobody cares about, the people who are putting the pipeline out, the people who are broke, broke people who are deeply infected by the banking problem right now. We don't see them, they don't exist. Right? Yeah. Now let's take it down a little more, get back to Octavius biting his toes maybe kind of place. Even, even from here to here, I work in a system that doesn't see me, that causes me to wake up raging because I'm not seen, to, to even like in our houses now, in our families, in our, in, the, in our closest neighbors, right? The one who's in the bedroom down the way, Uncle Bob, I love to use Uncle Bob as euphemism for that one you just totally know is saying xenophobic, hateful things, but he's coming to dinner. Guess who's coming to dinner? And he's coming to dinner bringing his stuff, but you've been raised to be quiet and nice about Uncle Bob, so he's just going to keep spewing it, and your children are going to overhear it and be formed by it. Because children will listen, right? And you didn't say anything to Uncle Bob because you don't like conflict. <laughs> but Uncle Bob just messing up the stuff, <laughs> right? And it could be Uncle Bob or it could be your dad could be your dad. So if you read my book, I tell dad stories. And he still loves me. It's shocking. <laughs> read the book twice. But my dad is my best example of Ubuntu, even more than Octavius and his toe biting. My dad is formed by his dad, or the absence of his dad. My dad is formed by his dad getting arrested at a moonshine still in, in rural Mississippi, and his mother marrying somebody like rah, mean stepdad. My dad is just formed by the anger in the household. My dad is formed by the violence that he watched, observed in rural Mississippi. He's formed by his mother inherits a wood farm from the second husband, and the white people try to steal it from her. And my dad has to pick up a shotgun to protect his mother when he's 11 years old. He's formed by that, right? If you call my dad 
He's, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. The most effusive, demonstrative, sweet person who, when hurt, is angry and really hard because he got hurt and it was really hard and hurt people hurt people. So it wasn't always fun. Daddy was the daddy who bathed you and threw water on you and made it fun. He threw you up in the air. He was amazing, amazing, amazing dad. But also, when you were becoming a person and he didn't like what he saw, <laughs> he could be deaf on you about that. I was talking to young people the other day and it's like, yeah, in my household, it's hard for me to be me because my mom, my dad has a picture of what they see for me and I'm not that. Can you relate to what I'm saying there, right? right? So this is, this, is the, this is the hard stuff. This is the, I can't see you as you. I need to see you as who I want to see you. A, a, a possessive delight, not a non-possessive delight, a possessive demanding relationship that impinges, is the word I would use, your becoming, right? That happened in my life. That happened in my house. That happened with my dad. As an adult, my dad and I had the best fight of our life because he was impinging me. We had some fights, but this was a good one. It was an excellent fight. I'm graduating with my PhD. I paid for it. I got it. I earned it. It's my party. And my friend John came to hang out at the party, and he was white and older and evidently reminded my daddy of somebody from Mississippi or something like that. And he just treated John like he was poop on a shoe. And John left my party. I did not enjoy that. But it, it was one of those moments that caused me to finally be a woman with my dad, not a girl child with my dad, but a woman with my dad, and really basically say, Daddy, I love you, and if we're going to do this, we're not going to do it. If we're going to do this kind of dynamic, we're not going to do it. I'm not recommending that you do this with your father or mother. <laughs> it might not work out, but it did for me to insist on my dad seeing me for who I was. And he loved me enough to come along, I mean to come along, like to work it out with me. I don't want to lose you, he says after the conflict. I do love you, I want to see you. And for the last, I'm 63, that's 43, for the last 20 years, my dad and I have a relationship that is born of mutual respect, not fear. A relationship that is born of, we can have conflict and survive it a relationship that is born of actually really seeing each other for who we are. And we had to fight our way to it. We got to it, but we pushed for it. I'm, I do want to recommend that we need to push to see each other. And we have to push to be seen because this is how we're human. Can I say that again? We have to push to see each other and we have to push to be seen because that is how we're human together. And I'm saying that's worth a little fight. That's worth a little conflict. That's worth a little truth telling. Because in all the places where we're not seen, where we're not seeing each other, we are not going to flourish. We are not going to survive. We are not going to thrive. I'm going to ask Michael Way to come talk to me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just ask you to. <laughs> Hi. So we've, we've, we know each other's stories. Yes. And um, I think you have stories to tell that relate to this concept of Ubuntu uh, in the household, being seen, not seen, um, and how that shaped you and what, and what that's been like in your own life with your own son. Indeed. Can I just give you the space to sure, talk about certainly, that? Certainly. I'm going to sit down right here while you okay. do that. OK. All right. Bye. All right. <laughs> you want me to talk to you? Oh, uh, yeah. Or them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Y'all want to hear Michael Way talk about it? Okay, yeah, to them. So this, this journey has been 20, 30 years mm -hmm. of reconciling with my own father, who um, for a long time I did not feel saw me, mm -hmm. valued me, affirmed my value. Mm -hmm. He was a product of his own time, mm -hmm. of the experiences in his childhood in rural Louisiana. He was the product of decisions that he made to not finish high school and join the army. He was a product of the trauma he experienced in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He was someone who was wrestling with what it meant for him to be 
the provider and the husband and the father at a time when the backlash against the civil rights movement was already unfolding in the early 70s mm -hmm. and finding it hard for him to make ends meet and to live up to his own expectations of what it meant for him to be a person who could be valued and seen. And so he turned to alcohol and it became his friend, it became his comfort, it became that which separated him from my mother and from me and my sister and my, and my younger brother for a while. And I had to make some decisions as the eldest in the house, as somebody who was now working odd jobs to try to help my mother pay the bills to decide that, you know, I don't know if I really need this man's affirmation anymore. I'm not going to seek it anymore. I'm going to make a decision that I'm going to affirm myself. Mm -hmm. And around that time, my father came to his own bottom, uh, if you will, his floor, um, as we say in the recovery movement, and he began a journey of sobriety, he became a part of a really big part of the recovery community in Compton, California, and that didn't do anything for me. <laughs> I knew what to do with a sick father, I didn't know what to do with a father who was trying to get well. Mm -hmm. And so I went through high school, not meeting him, not talking to him, mm -hmm. went on to college, left the house, didn't say goodbye, was just very happy to just move on. And he was diagnosed with cancer uh, around, my senior, around my senior, junior years of college. And in 10 months, he was gone. Mm -hmm. And in those 10 months, he and I got to say some things to each other that were helpful. And I had this idea that because of that work in those 10 months that we were reconciled and everything was going to be okay. I'm gonna live with the pain of being only 23 and my father's gone, my brother's 13, my sister's only 20, we gotta figure out how to do the rest of this life, we gotta support our mother, but I'm good. You fast forward, I'm married, we're pregnant, and I'm having nightmares. My father and I are fighting, physically fighting in these nightmares. And I'm in seminary, I'm writing journals every day for my pastoral care professor, who's also a therapist, and I'm telling him about these dreams. And he says, come sit down. He says, you think you've reconciled with your father because of the things you said to one another in those 10 months that he was dying. But you still have work to do to reconcile and forgive this father who couldn't see you, who didn't see you, because you're afraid that you're going to be him with whoever this child is. And so that began a long journey of therapy and discussion <coughs> um, in my family about what it meant for me to offer to my father the forgiveness that I had been holding back from him. And I thought that I was done with my first round of therapy, Jackie. And <laughs> I was in my 40s, feeling like I was doing a pretty good job of being a dad to my son. And I'm in another therapeutic relationship and we're doing the intake, and I'm telling him my story, everything I just told you. And he says, so have you, you've forgiven your father? I said, yes, I have forgiven my father. Um, I love my dad. Um, I love everything. I, I love all the things about him that are now a part of who I am. I've come to see him for who he is in his fullness, warts and all, and I love him, and of course I forgive him. And the therapist says, so you've forgiven him? I said, yes. He said, well, have you asked him to forgive you? And I said, for, <laughs> for what? And he said, for removing him from his proper place as your father. And I said, I think I understand what you're saying, but you do know that I had to do that. He was killing my soul, and I had to make an adjustment in my relationship with him that I don't, I don't need him like that because I'm not going to survive my childhood that way. And he says, I understand that, but you do know that this adjustment that you've made here served you then but is not serving you now. 
It took him, the therapist, like a whole year to convince me that he was right. <laughs> I would drive to the appointment saying, I'm going to fire his behind. And I didn't, and I didn't say behind. I'm going to fire his behind if he asks me one more thing about my dad in this session today. But eventually I learned what it meant to extend forgiveness, not like this, to a father who's sick or a father who's no longer here but to extend forgiveness like this and seek forgiveness like this. To see and be seen. And that's been the journey of this aspect of my life and my relationship with my adult son who lives here in this state. Like, what does it mean for me to be in his life in a way that I needed my dad to be in my life? Down. Stay with me. Stay with me for just a minute. So Michael Ray, that uh, dad journey, uh, you know, is one we have in common. And my dad is so different than he was when we were children and so different than he was 20 years ago. And he did not do therapy, but I did. And I think as he has lived now to 88, just diagnosed with um, Lou Gehrig's disease, he didn't go to therapy, but I went to therapy. He didn't go to therapy, but my brothers went to therapy. And what we learned, what we did, how the work we did on loving the dad inside of us. I want to highlight that Michael Ray said that, that, that my mom is inside me. You know, as a part of me, my dad is inside of me as a part of me, my brothers and sisters are inside of me as a part of me. All kinds of objects, is what a psychologist would say, are in me. So I was able to make peace with my dad inside me. And then I could make peace with my dad outside of me. Is that something yes, that you relate? Absolutely. Yeah, right? Absolutely. And I mean, even though he's no longer with us, I mean, I, my therapist assigned me the responsibility of going to his grave. Mm and making peace with him and extending to him, as you're saying, the peace that I was cultivating yeah. within myself. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that part. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. So I don't know what you thought that we were gonna do this morning as we talked about Ubuntu, but I wanna say this right here, this inner seeing that what has happened to you has shaped you. Seeing that for good, for bad, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, the people who have loved you are in you. And they're in you as either hope and support and encouragement and at a girl, or they might be in you as, oh my God, I should be afraid of jumping off the furniture, uh, or is I can't, or I shouldn't, or who I am isn't exactly okay. All of it's in you. And our job as adults, I would say, is to get our story straight. To look at the stories that are inside us, to think about the stories that are inside us as narratives that have created us, but stories that can be changed, stories that can be redacted. I am beautiful, I am powerful, I am amazing, I am strong, I am healthy, I am all right, or I'm sometimes really just mean, or, or when I'm lonely, I strike out, or like all the things that are just truly you, to you to see you. So you exist. Do you understand what I'm doing there? You see you fully, and then you have a chance to be truly, authentically who you are. CJ started with that this morning. Your authentic you is the you that can love the world authentically. Your true self, not your false Patina, your false self, the I need to show this to the world, I can't let anybody know, that can't love, facades can't love. Facades can't love. Personas can't love. They can perform, but facades and personas can't love. They can be affectionate, <laughs> they can have sex, they can have romance, they can buy hots and flowers, they can't love because they're not real. That Velveteen Rabbit book, 
you know, it gets roughed up into being real. Yeah. We got to, I loved my father when I was a young woman, afraid of him, but I didn't love him. I feared him. I respected him. I didn't love him. I'm not sure I liked him because I was terrified of him. But my daddy, my daddy, my 88-year-old daddy who calls me every day to check on me, who asks for the man John that he didn't like is the one I ended up marrying. Oh, my God, he loves John to pieces. My daddy and I, my daddy and I, have curated real love between us. And so also my siblings. And what I'm saying is that has to happen in these relationships, and that then has to happen at work kinds of relationships, and then that can happen in the world. You see how we started with out here this morning in the world, and then to these relationships that are sort of more, let's say, you know, corporate or, or professional, student, teacher, you know, colleague, da 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 But right here also, from the closest one to the child in Mississippi with dirty water, we won't be able to do justice, to love mercy, to be kind, to be activists, to heal the world with love if we do not have it here. And the only way to have it here is with truth. You can't reconcile your conflicts without truth. You can't get well without truth. You can't make peace without truth. Secrets will kill our souls, won't they? And we've been taught to be polite and keep secrets. I want us to unlearn that. I want you to value a little conflict, a little fight. I told my staff the other day, my husband told me, I fight more than I used to. I'm like, that's right. Because I'm more integrated, right? My Justice Jackie be out there fighting. Do not do that to those people. And the other people are like, hi, hi, I'm Jackie, I'm happy. You know, I feel more integrated because I'm fighting for a just world. I'm fighting to be seen at work. I'm fighting to be seen in my family system, with my spouse. And I'm fighting for me to be me. Do you understand? Do, I don't want you to die not being you. I don't want you to live a life that is not true or authentic. I want to say, Salbona, Kitty, I see you. And for Katie to say back, Sincona, I exist. I am this woman who's wearing my Irish things today, who's sitting next to my partner today in this classroom. I want you to be fully you, and I want to see that. I want you to be fully you. I want you to be fully you, because the full you can do something about the hot mess out here. It is all connected. Do you understand? This self Knowing this self, loving this self, appreciating this self, seeing this self, seeing your mama, daddy, cousin, brother, husband, partner, wife, girlfriend, that intimate circle, seeing, loving them, and seeing the world as part of you is our human journey. That is what Ubuntu is about. It is to fiercely love self, neighbor, world. But it starts with you. So, Salbona, I see you. Sincona, I exist. And you do too. Let's do, let's do the love thing together. Thank you so much. second microphone? I don't, yeah. So, all right. Um, Jackie, I'm going to ask you to stay up here. Thank you so much for this presentation. I see so many connections between last night and this morning, but as promised last night, there is some time for Q&A after this morning's program. If you're up for it, are you up for it? Okay. And, 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 and when we wrap, wrap, before, when we have five minutes to wrap, I have music to play. Okay. That's because I just roll that way. So we'll do Q&A and then we'll roll the music. Q&A and Excellent. then music. Sound okay. good to everybody? All right. Who, I can bring this around. Who has a question? I see you. This is, 
this is not a question. This is just an affirmation from a woman here who's waiting for the chariot. I talked to you. Caroline, right? Yeah. Right. As a matter of fact, Neil Diamond wrote the song for me, Sweet Caroline. Are you kidding? I was, I'm not, yes. Can I have your I mean, autograph? he didn't know that. <laughs> okay. okay. He said that he wrote it for Caroline Kennedy or, or you know, in dedication of <laughs> right. the little girl who lost her dad. Right. But um, I came out of the convent after 14 years. I wasn't even out yet to go to my new job working as the, um, oh, the activity person in a Golden Age Center. Some of you know me th that way. And I also did church work. I was a Holy Roman Catholic nun for 14 years. I don't know why God had me there, but I just thought going in the convent, my, my adolescent boyfriend took off on me. He was too slow, so I went in the convent <laughs> to work for God. No, I mean, this is, this is the funniest. And people say, you should write a book. I say, no, no, I've lived it. I've journaled. If I want to know what happened to me after my daughter's suicide death five years ago, I can read my journal. And, and you have just been totally transparent for us. I had no idea reading about you and all that. I had no idea that you just opened up for us about who we are with our families. I mean, it's just been totally revol... What's the word? Re revolution? Revolutionary. Revolutionary? <laughs> Every time I put my hand on something, a piece of burnt toast, God is saying to me, you did that too fast. You didn't... You weren't careful. I have thing, inanimate things, a pot holder and a, my butter holder is a cow, and my, my pot holder is a cow, and my spoon, my plate on my stove that holds spoons is a cat. That was my Callie, the best cat we ever had. We had lots. And the, the buttercup is the pot holder, and Elsie is the butter dish. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I just, I just am I don't so want grateful. Thank you. Thank for you. For my life and for you. I mean, we all have to just be filled with gratitude. Thank, Thank you, you, Caroline. Thank and listen, you. as the chariot comes, what I hope for you is beautiful, 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 beautiful memories and stories, and that you will read your journal. Um, and you are delightful. You are just a delight. Yes. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so that. much. You can clap. You can clap. Anytime. Hello again. Hey, Ian. How's it going? Hi. Um, I was first introduced to you a while ago from the, uh, the, the video that was done by Vice News talking about Loving versus Virginia. Oh, wow. That's a long time ago. And it, yeah. it, it was amazing for me. Huh. Um, I am... Put your mic up a little bit. I'm oh, sorry. Bit I am engaged to be married in October, mm -hmm. and my fiancé and I have been uh, in our premarital talking about... Mm -hmm. um, appreciating each other and everything and I'm interested to know how you in your own life have applied fierce love uh, to your relationship with Reverend John oh that's so nice well yeah I can't John is John is the best guy so partly I'm just really lucky really blessed that he's uh, very straightforward, really funny. We have the same Myers-Briggs type and odd humor together. Humor covers a multitude of sins and helps you have heart talks and just laugh. But also I think I learned this. Like I, I was married before and it didn't go as well. So just to be honest, I learned how to love more candidly, more truthfully, more vulnerably. The, the kind of, this talk of like don't have a facade comes directly out of my life of having a Jackie type, a, a, an almost Jackie. What would that be called, an avatar? Like an almost Jackie, right? Almost Jackie is in the room, right? Almost Jackie is dating this guy. 
almost Jackie, right? And then and kind of Jackie, you know, <laughs> is, at the, is saying wedding vows. And almost Jackie is like thinking, I'm really angry right now and I can't say it because then that person is going to hate me or leave me or whatever the thing. So fear does not make a good marriage. You know, our Christian scriptures say perfect love casts out fear, but it really means complete, fully complete love casts out fear. That's, that's what happened. I loved myself completely, accepted myself completely. And so by the time I got, I picked John and I picked John. By the time I picked John, I was picking from a whole self, not a broken self, not a false self, not a almost well self. And I think that's the most important thing I would say to couples getting married is can you really be yourself with that person? And if you're in the space where you're not sure, just at least slow down the wedding date. But if you are sure, you can be yourself, and they can be themselves, and I think that's a good partnership. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. How do you not get completely overwhelmed by the world's needs? <laughs> you know, we're thinking about what a hot mess the world is, yeah. and yeah. it's demanding of your yeah. attention everywhere. How do you, how do you focus? I do get overwhelmed. Um, this morning, uh, in my early John talk, which we do when I'm traveling, up, up, and then talk. He said, how are you doing? And I went, blah, 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 blah. I was like so overwhelmed. I can't believe that over here, I'm building this building and these people are controlling and you know, like all of that. Like from here to here to here, I can be overwhelmed. A really bad day is if it's in all the circles. If it's way out there in the outer world, people shooting black people right down here in this corporate world, people acting like I don't have a voice, and then also something inside my soul, that's a bad day. But I think overwhelm is human. I really do love it. And I think when I feel overwhelmed, I talk it out with somebody, John, a therapist, a friend. It makes me feel better. I'm an extrovert, so that helps me. But we might journal, we might meditate, but if we have hearts, they're going to crack wide open. And the best thing about having a heart cracked wide open is that's the space from which the love flows. So I think we take our overwhelm as a gift, right? Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. I feel so like Gabby Bernstein-ish today. I love her. She's my friend. I feel I'm in a very woo-woo space today. Like Gabby would be like, yes, your heart. I love her. So. Hi, good morning. Hey, Thank good morning. you so much Thank you. for this presentation. Today's my first day learning of you, seeing you, hearing about you. What's your name? Tamika. Hey, Tamika. Hi. That's your mama? That's I see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I wasn't even going to be here, but she asked me to come because of your presentation last night. Oh. Um, you touched on, you really talked about my whole entire life. <laughs> you and um, Wade. Brother Wade, yeah. yeah. Uh, my whole life, from the father, the alcohol, from the not being seen, from the, I mean, you guys literally, I've been on my phone taking notes, everything you're saying, it was so relevant to me. Um, even to my marriage, you said, personas and facades cannot love. Mm -hmm. And I was married to a narcissist who I couldn't figure out why he couldn't love me. Mm -hmm. Yes, that'll do it. It will do it, <laughs> it will do it, you know. So thank you for your transparency and for reminding me that I am seen and that I have value and I have worth and it is not contingent upon someone else and what their flaws or lacks or inabilities are. So thank you so much. I see you, Miss Beautiful Tamika, <laughs> with you. your beautiful daughter that has everything to do with you and how you are. So thank you for speaking out. Appreciate you. Yay. <laughs> Hi. What's up, Al? What's up, my dude? Uh, so my question is, so different people go through life in different ways. And so some people might be more comfortable with exposure and like other people seeing them. Right. And other people might not. So how do you accept being seen, whether it's for the first time or just throughout your life? Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I just clarify? How does a person who lives more in interior life or introverted life or how do they accept being seen? How do they look? One more time. Just say one more time. 
More so, how do people who prefer to be hidden got it. accept being seen? That's really perfectly, yeah, got that now. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I think the preference to be hidden is just like personality style, right? Like some of us are behind the scenes people. Uh, some of us don't want to be in the spotlight. Some of us are introverts, get our energy from inside. So that kind of scene is just how someone is wired. And so I want to try to say differently what I mean by being seen. The way I mean is being known or being recognized. So that it isn't about whether it's a crowd or a TV spot or a, I got to talk in class, but it's more are there people in our lives who authentically recognize us? Yes, that's Elle's voice. Yes, that's Elle's pattern. Yes, that's how Elle writes. That's, you know, that, that just recognition of you, that, that acknowledgement of you, um, that, that's the way the, the Ubuntu scene means. And so I would say all of us need to be recognized, known, loved. That, that, uh, the recognized or, or acknowledged word is better there to explain what I mean. Does that help? Sort of. Yeah. If I could ask a follow-up sure. question. Mm -hmm. So how do I frame this the right way? Like recognition, being known for who you are and someone being like, I see you, girl with the pink sweater who looks so nice. Like that kind of thing. Like, there are certain people who don't really like the feeling of others seeing them because of how they see themselves. Yep, I understand. So how do you mm -hmm. accept the fact that others will see you? Yep. I hear that. I understand that question. And I think the way I would answer it right now is, and I'm going to try to frame this well, I don't think it's any kind of pathology or lack that makes someone not really want to be seen, right? I'm not saying that. But I am saying in this philosophy that I really agree with, somebody somewhere, somebody somewhere, some one person, two people, to vibe with who you are authentically, to resonate with who you are. See, I'm trying to change language from vision. Who can hear your voice and know it's true who can hear you sad, you sad, you alive, you worried, can hear you, can therefore know you. Whatever is that verb at, that is to take the sight away, the person who just is never going to feel comfortable with sight words. Don't look at me, I have friends, don't even look at me. Still need to be heard. Still need to be authenticated. That's what makes us real to ourselves. So change the verb in that and see if that works better for like, how am I known, right? That's, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for pushing that around with me. That's a whole talk to do differently is like to put some here words in there, right? Yeah. We have yeah. time for a couple more. You know what we could do? Um, because there's a lot of hands that went up. Could a couple people say their questions and see if I can wrap a couple into one? Maybe they're similar, something like that? Okay. First, so let, let, me, let me hear from a couple people who had their hands up over there, and let's see if I can put it together. Yep. And okay. Thank you for, uh, you, you gave me a gift today for the first time, I think maybe I've heard the words and that I could embrace is to push to be seen. Mm. And when you come up in environments where that's not the culture, you can become a David in a Saul's world when yeah. you push to be seen. That's right. And when you hear words like, look good, but not too good. Yeah. Do good, but, but don't good. outshine me. Mm -hmm. Creates its own tension when you push to be seen. And so I'm, 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 I'm grateful for the gift that you gave me today because it gave me the freedom to not worry about the javelins, mm. but still authentically own and embrace that there are reasons that I should be seen. Yeah. And uh, thank you again for, this is special for me being at BW, I'm a BW alumni. Wonderful. So th this is uh, an extra gift. I taught my first Bible study in the basement of this chapel oh, wow. over 40 years ago. Wow. Well, welcome home. <coughs> others? There were others? 
how can we be sure we're loving people for who they are rather than what they do or how they act? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say also that um, I saw you via Zoom at the Heartland Conference oh. annual gathering, and I just feel so blessed to be here in the same space with you today. Okay. Uh, you're just incredibly dynamic and wonderful. Um, my question is, how is there a way to forgive someone who has told you to your face that they don't want your forgiveness because they haven't done anything wrong? Well, yeah, sure. <coughs> Let me weave a couple of those together. First, a comment on the scene to pick up on Al's question, put it in relationship to your comment, push to be seen, push to be heard, push to exist, right? Just to add some more verbs in there, yes. And that's how we, that's how we live. I think we are sometimes going to love someone, love someone for what they do. And it might be our first pass at it with them. We might be seeing their shininess. We might be seeing their giftedness. We might be seeing their pink sweater. I don't know, but they, there is probably a first level of love that is about what someone does. And I think we challenge ourselves to say, let me go deeper than that. Let me look deeper. Let me listen deeper. Let me feel deeper. So you go on a first date with somebody and you're going to be like, well, so, oh, yeah, I, I ran the 400 or whatever, right? That's going to be a first level of knowing. But it is our holy curiosity, our, our, our courageous curiosity that takes us from the facade of the person or their accomplishments of the person to their deeper self. And I think that's just a journey we, we go on. And we go on it because we want to, right? Forgiveness is a gift to you. That's how I would say. You, you, can, you don't need somebody's permission to forgive them. That's so you let it go. In my book, I talk about downsizing our burdens. You, it's your fanny pack that's full of your stuff about that person, right? You'd be like, oh, then I want it. Well, I'm just going to do it anyway. Whatever that is you need to do to let it go and to forgive is for you first. And sometimes only, right? Only? Some, for, only. I'm in relationship with someone who has who defiled my soul. And because this person is in my family, and I want to be in my family, I have to forgive that person so I can be in my family. That's for me. Dragging that stuff around about that person is just like a pain in my behind, and it's heavy. So that's what I would say, sister. Just you do it for you. Right here, and right here, and then maybe let me hear the two of you. Ma'am, you had your hand up. You good? Beautiful woman in glasses. Hi. You had your you had your hand up. Are you good? You good? Okay. You did. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Hugh. Um, this is a comment. Uh, historical about the spiritual tradition that I hear you being in, in. And just to make a historical comment, it's just a hundred years ago, 1923, when we read or first heard of Buber's I and Thou. Yes, right. Yes, and I'm thinking of that far back, yeah. coming forward in our own lifetimes to hear the great Thich Nhat Hanh, right. uh, the Buddhist uh, spiritual leader, speak about interbeing yes. as the definition of what's between us. So I would like your comment on what I've suggested here about the spiritual tradition that you um, um, are nourished by. Thank you so much. And what I want to say is yes. <laughs> yes to Boober's I and Thou. Yes to Thich Nhat Hanh's inner being. And maybe also yes to gospel according to John. My, whoever is writing John is writing my soul. Uh, not his anti-Semitic stuff so much in the gospels, but this idea of what the love, what the beloved community looks like, sir, right? That, um, you know, God is love, right? God is love. And when we make a life inside love, with love as our container, compass, north star, all that thing, God inhabits us, is what I would say is really my deep theological conviction. I feel inhabited by God, by love, when I love. And it, that to me makes me a Christian. I am a Christian. But I also imagine Thich Nhat Hanh, right, and Buber, and... Um, Gandhi and 
the Buddha, uh, right, and teachings in the, there are other teachings about that um, interrelatedness and love being both causative and generated by it. So I, I would vibe with all of that. So I just wanted to kind of say yes, yes, sir, to that. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir, to that. Thank you. This is probably a good follow-up question okay. to that. Um, in a world or in a society that profits off of our not loving ourselves mm -hmm. and our not loving one another, right. it benefits <coughs> from that. And the fact that you are a pastor, you're, you're tasked with loving so many people. Um, how do you sustain that sense of connectedness with God within yourself, that sense of deep love? Mm -hmm. What is your day-to-day, week-to-week practice like yeah. of cultivating love for Jackie yeah. um, and just to, to keep going? <laughs> <laughs> well, since I'm Miss Transparent, I am terrible at, I'm terrible at um, hitting the pause button, to be honest. I just am. I don't, I probably don't need as much sleep as lots of people, but I cook on six, six and a half, seven, I'm fine. I don't do silence maybe as much as other people, but my favorite way to do spiritual practice is when I wake up in the morning and I'm walking through the crazy city of New York. I literally meditate on everything I see so the parents taking the kids to school is just like talking to Jesus to me. Like, I'm just like, oh my God, the fathers, <laughs> the fathers in New York are holding their teenagers, almost sons, like seventh graders, do you know what I mean? Like big boys are holding their dad's hands on the way to school and the fathers are talking and mentoring or I watch the grandmother or the nanny sometimes in New York, right? Like the little childing that they're doing takes me into a really deep place of gratitude for my own you know, love for mother and father and love from God. So I just sort of hijack, I, I hijack all the moments I can to remind me that I'm not on the planet by myself, that I'm loved by a God who is sacrificial and nurturing, that um, I can access that by deeply breathing, and I do that all day long. I don't set a time to pray every day, but I pray all day in the meeting and, and my venting, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like, I don't think God cares if we're yelling. So when I'm talking to John this morning about the crazy people, and, we're, and the things will be like, okay, we're gonna breathe now. So the exhale is that, all the stuff that hurts, and the inhale is together, we're going to access holy all day long. And I don't judge myself if I don't get it. I just don't, because I like me. I love me, I'm good with it. And I don't think God is like, trying to be mad if I, you know what I mean? And that's the whole thing that comes to us, right? Like, what does it mean for us to be Christian is this way. So I am flexible and nimble with myself and always feeling as close as breath, right? And I'm overcommitted. That's the third piece. I am so overcommitted. My chair of my board and my husband and I have a meeting next week for how we're going to get me from 60 hours a week to 50. Does that feel real? <laughs> Thank you for asking me a real question, because girl, <laughs> it be a lot every day. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I want to I want to play a song for you now as we wrap. It is um, Titus Burgess. Y'all do Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, that guy, right? He's a uh, Broadway uh, film actor uh, and my little brother. He's just crazy enough to be absolutely a, a fun thing to be. One time I was preaching a sermon and I said something like, we serve a God who throw parties for all the outsiders. You know, we, 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 we walk with Jesus who was made friends with the, with the ne'er-do-wells and the, and the, you know, outside street walking, anybody, tax collectors. And Titus was like, I think we need an album that celebrates that kind of love. But this song is very personal to him and to me. Love is an action, and it's just really our closing prayer. We're going to hear it, not see it. So if you want to close your eyes, this beautiful tenor, love is an action, a verb, not a word. This is my benediction to you that we go out and do love, not just think about it, but do it. And I'm, I'm so grateful to you. This 
Consider how you love
I have a playful benediction I give at church. Receive it in the spirit of joy and play. Go in the world and make love everywhere. Amen. Thank you. I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I had inklings of how massively overcommitted you are when we invited you to come here, and it was, I only had hopes that we would have this chance, and I'm so glad that you're here. We have one more event left in the series, 2 o'clock today. It's not going to be in this room. It's in the Union, the basement of the Union, Sandstone 3, at 2 o'clock. There will be more time for Q&A then. So thank you all for being here. I hope to see you this afternoon.